Thank you so much, Paul, for the invitation. I am thrilled to be a part of the session uh, this afternoon. Um, and if, uh, if you had looked ahead at the program and, and saw, oh, an entropic bond, I didn't learn that in chemistry class and tried to Google it, you probably didn't find anything. And that's because <clears throat> there, there, is, if, there is in principle no such thing as an atropic bond, but I'm going to show you some results that, uh, that we think can be understood by thinking loosely in terms of uh, entropic bonds. Let's see here. That does not work the way I was expecting. So I'm just gonna stand right here and do that. Um, 2019, as we heard, is the international year of the periodic table of elements. Um, as physicists, we know that all matter is comprised of combinations of elements that mix and match in a variety of ways to produce structures and behaviors that range from the incredibly simple to the extraordinarily complex, from a salt crystal uh, to the human brain. And as physicists, we also know that chemical and physical bonds are what produce unique atomic arrangements and, uh, and these material properties in a, in a quick Google uh, search will we'll give you uh, examples of the, the major types of, of chemical bondings that we're all familiar with, as well as uh, special flavors of these different kinds of, of bonds. If we think in terms of, of thermodynamics and try to understand how, uh, how um, materials, given these uh, various types of uh, interactions and chemical and physical bonds among the constituents, how do materials, uh, how are materials produced? Well, thermodynamics drives matter towards states of minimum free energy. And I'll mention that in contrast to the last talk, which is all about not equilibrium, avoiding the crystal in order to get a glass, all the examples I'm gonna talk about today are trying to avoid a glass and trying to get crystals. And crystals uh, are states of, of minimum free energy. So free energy minimization is why water molecules arrange into an ice structure in the freezer. It's why proteins fold. It's why carbon can form graphene or any one of its other um, um, structures that we, we saw this morning, or sorry, earlier today. Um, Thermodynamics also drives, uh, is thermodynamic uh, free energy minimization is also why the silver nanoparticles that are shown here on the left can self-assemble in solution into a complex crystal structure where the, where the particles are acting like the atoms um, uh, and they are forming a, a, a structure that is isostructural to a high pressure form of, uh, of, the, of lithium. And uh, free energy minimization is also why the gold nanoparticles that are very, very small, you can't see them, are able to uh, link together with DNA to form these exquisite crystals that are such high quality that they can grow very large and, and be able to now adopt uh, the wool shape of, of a crystal. Um, and these are examples from Chad Merkin's group on the right and Peidong Yang's group uh, on the left. So here the nanoparticles are like the atoms and the interparticle interactions are driving the formation of these colloidal crystals. So let's remind ourselves, go back to statistical thermodynamics 101. Um, what do we mean when we say uh, free energy minimization? So uh, free energy, you can describe free energies in different ways. Uh, if we think in terms of the canonical thermodynamic ensemble, the free energy can be written as the potential of the energy of the system minus T times the entropy of the system. And this U, the potential energy, that's where all the interactions are. That's where all the bonding is. Uh, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if, if you're talking about atoms and, and, and molecules, uh, and it's where uh, you know, DNA-driven interactions and Van der Waals interactions and, and any kind of interparticle uh, interactions are all subsumed into this potential energy term. But what happens if you don't have any potential energy in your system? Then what? Well, then the free energy is simply given by minus T times the entropy. And so free energy minimization simply becomes uh, entropy maximization, again, if there's no energetic interactions. And so now you're asking, well, what possible system could there be 
in which there is no interparticle interactions and no potential energy whatsoever. So <clears throat> here is such a system. This is showing a, 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 a molecular simulation, Monte Carlo simulation, of hard colloidal particles. So colloidal particles are micron size down to you know, a few hundred uh, or even down to 50 nanometers in size. Um, it is possible at the larger scales to screen the interactions um, between, uh, between particles in, in solution so that you effectively have nothing, no interactions except for steric excluded volume interactions. And in this simulation, the, the, um, the particles are tetrahedrally shaped and they are at a, a packing fraction that is high enough that they started to arrange. Now, <clears throat> this happened 10 years ago, just a little over 10 years ago, when uh, my uh, then student was simulating interaction between uh, uh, CAD telluride nanoparticles in solution and, uh, and turned off all of the forces and so that he had just hard interactions and, and no potential energy. And, and came and showed me this and he says, oh, this is ordering, it's making a crystal. And I said, no, that is, cannot possibly be true, run it again. Well, it turns out that it is true. Um, and, and the way that we kind of figured out what it was is that, uh, we, that he made all of the particles like different colored and translucent so we could see through them. Um, and then you start to see these patterns, these rings and other rings and all these, these you know, other types of uh, images, uh, uh, patterns, I should say. Um, and it turns out that indeed this box of hard tetrahedrally shaped particles self-assembled into a dodecagonal quasi-crystal, like the quasi-crystal we heard about um, from, from Philip Kim earlier, um, uh, the uh, dodecagonal quasi-crystal is, uh, is quasi-periodic in two dimensions and periodic in the third dimension. So this, if you look over here, this is looking down uh, the periodic direction, down, down the 12-fold uh, symmetry axis. And, it, it, and so what happens is, so I should mention that all of the particles are the same type. I'm using color just to distinguish different, pa uh, different local packings and patterns. What happens is that five tetrahedra come together and make a pentagonal dipyramid, and 12 of them get together in a ring, and then, then there's another pentagonal dipyramid and another ring, et cetera, et cetera. And these things line up to make these columns that, that stand up next to one another and shift a little bit. And, uh, and, um, and, and that's my phone, right? <laughs> you have my permission to enter the purse and turn off that phone. Thank you. <laughs> I'm like, nobody uses that ring but me. Um, okay, so this is, so, okay, so this was a big surprise. It was, first of all, a big surprise that uh, tetrahedra would organize into anything. Um, it was also really a surprise that if it organized into anything, it would organize into um, into a quasi-crystal. And of course, quasi-crystals we know are, are uh, you know, very, uh, interesting um, and primarily found in metals comprised of different uh, metallic elements. They've also, in the last 10 years or so, been discovered in a number of soft matter systems, systems where you have, say, block copolymers or dendromers forming micelles, and then the micelles act like the atoms, and they arrange into a quasi-periodic pattern, and almost always it's a 12-fold uh, uh, type of um, uh, quasi-crystal that, that you get. Um, but it had never been found in, um, in colloids, in, in a, in a three-dimensional colloidal system. It turns out if we looked at the, the scattering, uh, the diffraction pattern of our quasi-crystal, if we imagined that there were, that we were scattering off the centers, off the centroids of the particles, then our diffraction pattern uh, can be superimposed on top of this one, the tantalum tellurium quasi-crystalline chalcogenide. So our quasi-crystal is isostructural to this one that was found back in, in 1998. So how is it possible that with no en en energy, no potential energy, and only entropy, that the simplest possible three-dimensional shape 
can form one of the more complex uh, structures that, that, uh, that we know of. So let's remind ourselves about entropy. Um, we learned back in kindergarten that this is how you write the Gibbs entropy, um, and where the, the, these piece of eyes are just the probability of a microstate. And a microstate is just a snapshot of a system, of a thermodynamic system. It's a snapshot of where all the atoms or molecules are at any instant and how they're arranged relative to each other. And right now, if I took a snapshot of this room, that's a microstate of this room. But if I asked Mark and Kate to switch places, that would be another microstate. And all the ways that I can arrange all of you and all the seats are all the microstates that are possible in this room. And as you know, not all the microstates in this room right now are equally likely Right? It's not equally likely that you would all be sitting in the front. Right? So some of, the, some of these microstates are weighted differently, and that's what these piece of eyes are. So if you simply know the weight of a microstate and take the log, multiply it by the, micro, by the probability, and add them all up, that is what the entropy is of a system. It's just counting up the microstates suitably weighted. OK. So all microstates with the same energy are equally likely. This is what we learn in Statistical Thermodynamics 101. In the case of these hard particles, not only do all the microstates have the same energy, they have no energy. Um, and so because they have no energy, then the probability of every microstate is equal. All microstates in this system are equally likely. Because of that, you just put that you just, the, the probability of a microstate is just one over the total number of microstates, and you plop that into the Gibbs expression, and you get the Boltzmann expression for the entropy. And so in these systems, free energy minimization, which just becomes entropy maximization, is just maximizing the number of possible microstates, the number of possible ways of arranging and placing all of the particles in the system. That is what it's trying to, 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 to do. Now, why this is so, this might seem counterintuitive, is that it means that you can have emergence of order if there are more ways to be ordered than disordered. Right? Very counterintuitive. But actually, we have known this for 60, 70 years. Um, we have known this since the time of Onsager, who, who said that if you, and he argued this for infinitely long rods, and this is a simulation of shorter rods, but it captures the point that Onsager made that if you crowd um, long molecules together, um, just from steric interactions, if they want to stay in equilibrium, they will give up rotational entropy to gain translational entropy because there's more ways of placing all of the rods if they are lined up in the same direction than if they're pointing every which way as you increase the density. And then Kirkwood came along and said, oh, I bet this is true for spheres, too. And people said, well, that's ridiculous. What do you mean? There, there is no rotational anything. And, uh, and he predicted that, uh, that if you took hard spheres and you crowded them enough, and here it's at a density of about 50%, so 50% of the box is empty, 50% is full of spheres, it would spontaneously crystallize from a disordered fluid into a face center cubic crystal. And in fact, it, it does, and it does this because, and this is exactly the opposite of what we just heard from Mark in terms of oranges, um, in because, and I'll explain why, there are fewer ways of being disordered than there are of being ordered. There are more microstates that are consistent with the crystal phase than there are consistent with, uh, with, a, with the disordered phase, with the, with the liquid phase. And one way to see this um, is, is, is this. So the densest random packing for a box of identical spheres is 63%. So you cannot, if you, if you insist that, you're, that, this, that the balls be random, you cannot pack them denser than 63%. But we know since, um, since uh, the time of Kepler uh, that the densest packing of spheres is actually 71.05%. And so how is that possible? That means that if you took these, this random arrangement of spheres and you organized them, then you could Go, you'd have more microstates available to you. And so 
this is because we're not talking in this case about densest packings. We're talking about where we're away from infinite pressure, away from densest packing, and the systems are still in equilibrium. <clears throat> this, was, this was predicted by computer simulations and, of course, argued and argued and argued for decades. Um, and then it was, it was, uh, it was um, solidified. I didn't want to say it, but there it is. Um, in this beautiful paper, groundbreaking paper by Paul Chaikin and, and Bill Russell and collaborators, which included the STS-73 space shuttle crew. This was published in Nature in June of 1997 on the crystallization of hard sphere colloids in microgravity. Why microgravity? Because they, they took um, uh, plastic um, uh, submicron size, I think these were about five, 600 nanometer spheres, and density matched them to a solvent um, so that you could eliminate all gravitational effects and you could do that the best in a microgravity environment on the space shuttle. And indeed, once the packing fraction of spheres exceeded 50% of a liquid of colloids crystallized into a face center cubic crystal. So what's happening in our systems here is just like Onsager and Kirkwood on steroids. Um, this, is a, this is a simulation of, um, of hard octahedra uh, and it starts off in the, blue, in the blue fluid phase and then nucleates and grows a body centered cubic crystal phase. Again, simply because there are more microstates available to the system if the particles order than if they stay disordered. And that's how the system maximizes entropy at a fixed uh, uh, density or fixed packing fraction. So how far can we go with just shape and entropy? Well, it turns out that colloidal crystals as structurally and uh, complex as these atomic crystals um, can arise in systems of hard po colloidal particles due solely to, to entropy. Here's just a few examples um, that, that we have found um, through our computer simulations uh, where here's an example, each one of these is a different shape particle. You throw them in a, in a box, you do Monte Carlo or molecular dynamic simulations where you're just exploring all the microstates either statistically or, or classically. And, uh, and they will all, all, in all of these cases, it spontaneously self-assembles from a disordered fluid into a crystal. So for example, if you take a hard de dodecahedra and you throw them in a box and get above like 55, 60% packing fraction, uh, you'll get a, a crystal structure with 20 particles in the unit cell that's isostructural to the beta manganese uh, crystal structure. If you, if you snip the vertices and truncate it a little bit, then it will, instead of forming beta manganese, form a gamma brass phase. And this is despite the fact that there are two Wyckoff -like positions of beta manganese and four in gamma brass, and yet there's only one type of particle here. So it turns out that although we knew that entropy could order um, uh, uh, objects in thermodynamic equilibrium with even in the absence of any kind of uh, interactions, um, it, we didn't realize how rich uh, of, uh, of a space of possibilities that could be, and how simply by changing the shapes of the particles, we could get an extraordinarily um, uh, rich complexity and diversity of crystal structures. So here's an example where we, we took 145 different, different shapes, and each one we did simulations of, and of these 101 uh, crystallized, and these 44 um, just didn't. Eventually, we ran them long enough that some of them did, but some of them, some of them didn't, and they stay, they stay disordered. And one example that I'll show you that was highlighted at this meeting is we had predicted um, in a previous paper that if you take the tetrahedra that I was just showing you and you snip the corners to make a truncated tetrahedron, um, then truncated tetrahedron do solely to entropy would, would self-assemble into the diamond structure. And sure enough, uh, Stefano Sakana, who's a sister professor in chemistry uh, at NYU, who is a, 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 a brilliant experimentalist, he and his students synthesized these PMMA um, truncated tetrahedra and sedimented them was able to screen out all the interactions and do solely to entropy, found the diamond structure that, that was predicted. <clears throat>
So <clears throat> now let me show you what is the most complex crystal structure we have found to date in our simulations to self-assemble uh, into a crystal. If you take the truncated tetrahedron that we were just talking about and you truncate also a little bit the edges, then you get this complicated thing. It's trying to crystallize and it's still trying, it's still trying. And what you're not seeing here but fuzzed out in blue is a low density fluid phase. And now you get this crystal. This crystal has 432 particles in the unit cell. Just, just due to entropy, it's a, it's a isostructural to a Bergman-like uh, phase. Um, and, uh, and I don't know how far we can go. Um, if you can get 432 particle unit cells, why not more? So we are now on a quest to find what atomic and molecular crystal structures can't we obtain with only entropy? Of the 230 space groups, already we have roughly 50 or so. And so we're marching through and trying to find if we can get you know, an example from every space group due solely from, from entropy. And I'll mention that what I'm showing you now is just with one species, we can mix different shapes together. And if we mix different shapes together, Sometimes we get cold crystals that are also very, very complex. So what other implications are there of um, entropic ordering besides the possibility of producing these very complex crystal structures? Well, we know that if you, uh, you take a fluid and it crystallizes, you know, typically we talk about nucleation and growth. Um, in, sometimes it's not a very straightforward, simple step of classical nucleation and growth. Sometimes you can get you can go from a fluid to an intermediate phase and then to the crystal. And that is what was happening in the simulation of that Bergman-like phase where there was a, a, an intermediate fluid that is metastable to the crystal. And so the, 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 the system I showed you was actually first undergoing a fluid-fluid phase transition and then the fluid-solid transition. And so here are snapshots of that movie that I showed you where it starts as a fluid, and these are diffraction patterns, and you see no structure, no structure, no structure, no structure, no, no, maybe a little bit, and then now you have this structure. Um, and as you go along in time, these, you see the, the emergence of these orange clusters, and at the end, these, so these orange clusters are, are all connected with each other, and at the end, these clusters separate, and you get this cage-like crystal structure. Um, and so this is a, this, you have in, in this intermediate part, you're ha you have a co coexisting fluids prior to crystallization. Let me show you another example of a fluid fluid transition with nothing but entropy before crystallization. So this is a system of a pentagonal dipyramid that looks like this from the top and la like that from the side. Um, and I'm gonna show you the top view and the side view. When the particle is colored blue, it means that it's in the an original uh, fluid phase. And when it's colored yellow, that is the second phase of fluid that emerged. And then you're gonna see the green crystal growing from that. And so here the green crystal is starting to grow. And there it is. And it's growing in these kind of fibers with space in between them. There is no way that if I stopped you in the hall and showed you this movie that you would say, oh yeah, there's no interaction whatsoever between those particles, right? They look like there's some kind of attractive force between these particles that's causing them to crystallize. Once it crystallizes, it has 244 particles in the unit cell. Here's one more. This is a triangular bipyramid um, that is a little, it's a regular triangular bi bipyramid that's squashed and it has 109 0.5 um, angle. Um, it starts out as, as an isotropic fluid. Phase separates into two coexisting fluids, a, a less dense one and a more dense one. The more dense one here is the light, is this light blue. The less dense is the fuzzed out part. And then it starts to crystallize and it, it forms this, um, this clathrate crystal. It's a clathrate one, run, clathrate one structure with 92 particles in the unit cell. It's exactly the same crystal structure that 
Chad Merkin's group published um, um, with us doing some supporting simulations that they found with gold nanoparticles linked together with DNA, where the DNA is pulling the faces of the particles together. Here there's no DNA, there's nothing. But the Onsager on steroids idea is that the particles are giving up rotational degrees of freedom to align their faces to give them more microstates available to the system. And here's what it looks like when the clathrate crystal phase is growing inside of this box from this amorphous crystal phase. So the system <clears throat> phase separates in these coexisting fluids. The dense fluid locally looks like the crystal. And then the crystal is growing at that interface. And so it creates this sort of, you know, it, it templates um, the crystal. And here's what it looks like if you, if you look at the network representation that is commonly used for, for clathrates. And in all of these cases, we can calculate equations of state. Um, we could do it in isochoric or isobaric conditions. And in every case, we find a very nice first order phase transition where the where the, the strength of the phase transition increases with the increasing dimensionality of this pre-nucleation motif that we see emerging um, in, in these fluids. Now, fluid-fluid transitions and two-step nucleation and growth are observed in real clathrate systems, uh, molecular clathrates in proteins and other molecular uh, systems. In our systems, it's arising because and I'll, I'll use the word entropic bonds before justifying them. The entropic bonds are arranging particles into a water-like or silica-like tetrahedral network of tetramers. This is a tetramer, and when five of these tetramers get together, that's, the, that's like the, the water molecule or the silicon molecule that then makes these clathrate-like uh, structures. The key point here is that the origin of the forces that's driving assembly into the clathrate structure, and including that's driving these fluid-fluid transitions, is irrelevant. All you need here is geometry. So Van der Waals would not be happy with this because the Van der Waals equation of state says that this is not possible. Um, you remember the ideal gas law, and Van der Waals said that the that the um, the necessary elements that you must add to an, a, an ideal gas in order to have a phase transition are two things. You need to add an excluded volume, so you can't just have ideal gas particles like going through each other. They have to have some kind of steric uh, interaction, excluded volume, and you have to have attraction. And this new equation of state, the Van der Waals equation of state, these are isotherms, so, for, so you can change the temperature, and for every temperature, plot this, these, this, this equation. And at high temperatures above some critical temperature, it's monotonically decreasing, uh, pressure versus volume. But below the critical temperature, that's when you start to get that, that dip, and you have uh, now two-phase coexistence possible. If you don't have this attractive term that Van der Waals said you have to have, well, then you don't have this 1 over V squared. So you cannot possibly get this uh, non-monotonic behavior. And yet, we are getting a fluid-fluid transition. You could call it a, I wouldn't call it a liquid gas transition because it's not. Liquids cohere. This is, this is a box of particles that if I were to take the box away, the particles would just go away, right? They have to be crowded and then subject to those constraints figure out how to optimize the number of microstates in the system. What's happening is that the shape and isotropy of these particles is creating um, emergent, effective, and tropic attraction upon crowding. And we can see examples of this that are like you see um, uh, with metallic bonds, like you see with covalent bonds, like you see in molecular liquid crystals. Um, and so every shape of particle has its uh, counterpart at the atomic or, or molecular scale. So let me just say a few words about uh, the idea of the entropic bond and why it might be useful to think of it that way. So it's possible to quantify the strength of these entropic, effective, emergent att uh, uh, att attractions 
between particles by writing down, and I won't go through this, a potential of mean force and torque that basically calculates what is the effective interaction between any two neighboring particles. And when you look at the expression, there's a clear competition between two terms. If you have a box of particles and they're moving around, any two neighboring particles, if there were no other particles in the system, would never be like that. They'd be all over, right? They, don't, they, they want to be able to explore uh, uh, as much volume as possible. But the other particles in the system want these two particles to be as close together because the more volume there is, more free volume, the more ways of arranging the particles, the more microstates, the higher the entropy. That competition of terms um, gives rise to the, 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 the way that the particles end up organizing themselves to maximize the entropy. And so you can calculate, for example, if you had a box of trun truncated tetrahedra, that was um, you know, dense, sleep, uh, you know, dense above say 50, 60% packing fraction, and you ask what is the difference um, in free energy between being arranged like this or being arranged like that, it turns out that it's, it could be 3 kT at very moderate densities before the system has even crystallized yet. And if we compare the entropic bonds that we can calculate in all our systems with the typical strength of all the other bonds and interactions we know of, they are not insignificant at all. So when we think about entropic bonds, of course they're not chemical bonds. They are interactions mediated by local fluctuations, not in electron density, but in entropy density. So complex crystals and crystallization pathways are possible for hard colloids complete with fluid-fluid phase separation despite the absence of explicit attraction. And as we'll see in our next talk, uh, the fluid-fluid or liquid-liquid phase separation is also something that is, is present um, in cells. So entropy can order matter. That's the thing to take, take away. That is counterintuitive. Um, there are important implications of entropic bonds for nanoparticle self-assembly, where we're typically thinking about, well, we're, we're making these nanoparticles out of these materials. We put them in this, in this solvent, like catelluride in water. We're going to put these organic ligands, like DMAET or TGA ligands, and we can design that to control the interactions. But we never think about, and how do I engineer the entropy? And we, or we never think about what are the contributions of entropy to creating the crystals that we see? Or is it all just due to enthalpy? Um, there could be implications of entropic bonds in driving liquid-liquid phase transitions in cells and in other instances of macromolecular crowding. That's something that, that we're, we're looking at. Um, and we can engineer now the entropy of a system in the same way that we can engineer uh, nanoparticle interactions. So I will stop here and take your questions. Wonderful. Uh, we have time for some questions. Uh, if you can go to a microphone if you have some. Uh, sure, head to a mic. Okay. Yeah. Um, so how do you define actually a temperature in this case? That's a great question. Like, uh, or melting temperature. So, in, in, so there's no, there's no uh, temperature scale here. If there's no energy, right, there's no temperature scale to, 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 to think about. Um, it doesn't come into, for example, these Monte Carlo sim simulations because the Boltzmann factor is, is one, right? So temperature is not the relevant variable here. Uh, density is, or packing fraction, however you want to call it. Uh, to, to clarify, aren't you giving some excitations to make these vibrate and wiggle? Uh, uh, you're shaking yeah. the box or something? So, so, so what we're doing is we're not shaking the, bo the right. box, but the particles are randomly moving around as though they're undergoing Brownian, okay. Brownian motion. But it's important to note that the dynamics are not uh, required to, to see this. This is a thermodynamic thing. So in the infinite in limit of a, of a very large system, um, you will see this, the, this is the solution okay. um, to, the, to the problem. Okay. All right, there was another person on this side. Is there some fundamental relation between the complexity of the shape and the ultimate unit cell that it 
Thanks. Oh my God, if you know what it is, can you tell me? <laughs> um, we are working hard to try to figure out um, what, what that might be. Um, it, some years ago, we tried to do this and, and failed. Um, and I thought we'd never be able to do this. Recently, um, uh, some members of my group have done a lot of simulations to produce more data than we've ever had before and did some machine learning on this data to try to find correlations between certain aspects of the shape and certain crystal structures. And it works to some extent, like but we don't trend, yet know why. Like local trend, like more complex shapes have larger unit cells. Like you've no. plotted all this data out. No, it has not, no. I don't, know, I don't know how to say which shape is more complex than another. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, you know, it just, so we don't know which kinds of shapes will give more complex structures. Mm -hmm. All right, I think there was someone on this side. This is really fascinating work. Uh, I'd like to get some uh, clarification on the entropic bond idea. Um, in, this, in the 50s, and by Osawa and others, they proposed this idea of, of uh, depletion force. Yes. And are, are those two sort of similar, related? Yeah, so one can say it's like self-depletion, but it's, di it's, it's different. So depletion forces are when, say, you have colloidal particles like the ones that we have here, and then you throw in a bazillion much, much, much smaller particles. Um, and, and, and tropically, it is unfavorable for those much smaller particles or typically little polymers to be in between two much bigger colloids. And so they go on the outside, you get effective increased osmotic pressure, and that is like an effective attraction between these two particles that can be enormous. Um, the reason why it can be so strong is because with so many of those little depletants, you have bazillions of microstates. Here, we have no depletants. We can put depletants in and we strengthen that interaction, but even without depletants, it's, it's the, still the idea that two particles, um, it's better for the other particles to be outside these two particles. So you can think of it a little bit that way, um, so, so, I mean, the, the difference in size, particle sizes are aside, it's, it's all a battle of packing that's really the origin of either depletion force and the entropic Yeah, bomb. in both of, I mean, in, in, the, in both cases, it's an entrop, it's entropically based. Um, but to get depleting forces, you typically need a, a second component in your system. All right, uh, let's have one more question on this side. Uh, it's a fascinating talk. Um, I, uh, I remember you showed uh, uh, the comparison between the entropic uh, bond and other chemical bonds. Mm -hmm. So how significant is the entropic bond compared, I mean, in the real world, how is that phase transition significant? Uh, oh, that's a, that's a great question. So <clears throat> it's, it's important in cases where nanoparticles or, or, or colloidal particles are self-assembling, then in principle, there are entropic interactions. It's just we typically think of entropy as leading to disorder. And we think it's, that it's just the, you know, Van der Waals interactions between gold particles in water or something, you know, meaning by, by water that's pulling particles together, or it's uh, Van der Waals interactions between ligands on nanoparticles that's pulling, that's causing them to come together in order. But it may be that entropy is actually contributing to the tendency for particles to want to align. It may be a very small contribution, but conceptually, I think it's a very important contribution. There may be other instances where it's the, it becomes the most dominant contribution. I, and I think that in biological context, it will turn out to be very important. Okay. Thanks. Neat. Let's thank our speaker again.